Hi guys, it's MJ, the student secretary, and in this video, I'm asking the question, is Bitcoin a commodity or a currency? Now, I've kind of fallen in love with this whole blockchain Bitcoin technology, and it's something incredibly fascinating. But something that I keep coming back to is I keep asking myself, what exactly is it? And this is an important question when we consider that regulation is going to start coming into the game. And depending on what is defined at, those are going to be the rules that get played out. So in this video, I want to look at, is Bitcoin a currency or is it a commodity? And there's different regulation rules that get applied to each of these. So it's quite an important question in the financial markets. So let's see, is it a currency? These are examples of some currencies. They're very pretty. They, they look really cool. Okay. But let's, let's consider currency. What is it? Okay, currency, it comes from the, the Latin word for circulation. at some sort of system of money. Uh, it's a recognized store of value. It's used, you know, people can trade it and exchange. And very much you can see that this is very similar to what we're seeing with Bitcoin. It's a system of money, recognized store of value. It can be traded. It's circulated. But this is where it gets interesting. Currencies are defined by governments. Most governments have their own unique currency, which they use to trade inside their, their country. And it is a form of legal tender. Now, legal tender means that if you want to settle a debt with the currency, it means that the person has to accept that payment in that currency. Right now, if you take Bitcoin and you try to cancel your debt with Bitcoin, the person can say no, and there's no legal repercussions for them doing so. And this is where Bitcoin is very, very different to your traditional currencies. Looking here at most currencies, you'll see that politicians' faces are on the notes because that's the thing is currencies are property of the government. You know, the government owns them and the government can do what they want with them. And, you know, sometimes they can do some good things. Sometimes they can do some bad things. I mean, something that's been happening quite uh, regularly has been something known as quantitative easing. So in America, what they've been doing is they've been printing money. So they just go to the, the big printers and the government's like, hey guys, let's print some more money and we're going to use this to stimulate the economy. Now, I know there's supposed to be controls in, you know, you have a central bank and it's separate from the government. But at the end of the day, these guys are working together to make the country work and make the country great. So they are in a little bit of in cahoots. But now, I was reading something with the, the quantitative easing, and it's something like the Americans have printed $3.5 trillion. I mean, that, that's a very big number. If that number is accurate, I mean, that's, that's like the size of the entire German economy. That is huge, that they've just printed, that they've just, you know, come up out of thin air. And the Americans, I mean, remember, they've got a lot of debt um, is controlled by the Chinese. So one way to get rid of their debt is to simply, you know, turn on the printers and print the money out. I must say that is something that happened in a neighboring country of mine in Zimbabwe, where Robert Mugabe went absolutely wild and just kept printing trillions and trillions. I mean, I don't even think there's a number that has got as many zeros, probably like a Google amount of Zimbabwean dollars. I mean, here's a note for 100 trillion dollars. And I think he went to his one debtor and he, and because the, the bond was denoted in their currency, he paid the entire um, bond that he owned to the International Monetary Fund with one note. It was, it's absolutely, it's ludicrous. And I mean, talking about Germany, we saw that, you know, back earlier in the last century, Germany also experienced some sort of hyperinflation. But let's talk about this whole inflation thing. I mean, inflation is the fact that the money starts losing a little bit of its value. And in this picture, it's kind of showing inflation in a negative light. You know, it's a rat eating away at your money. Um, 100 rand today or $100 today is not worth $100 uh, next year. You know, it's been inflated. It's worth less. You can buy less with that. But inflation is also a good thing because what inflation does is if I know that my money is deteriorating, or it's not going to be worth, you know, $100 next year, that encourages me to spend my money. And this makes, you know, the economy work. This gets money injected, money gets circulated, 
and people get jobs and it's beneficial for all. So inflation in a weird way is a good thing. What we're seeing in Japan is deflation. And you can see that's causing absolute chaos there because people are holding on to their money, they're not stimulating the economy, governments introducing negative interest rates, it's getting quite chaotic. Which means when it comes to Bitcoin, will Bitcoin have inflation or deflation? And as, as of today, I don't really know. I don't think anybody really knows if Bitcoin is going to continue to increase in value or if it's going to decrease in value. You know, what, what is going to happen with Bitcoin? And that, that makes it very worrisome from a currency point of view. But let's look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a limited supply. Only 21 million Bitcoins are going to be mined. And so this limited of supply can cause you know, pressure on the currency to or on the Bitcoin value to increase. But then what you do is you have investors who like, okay, we know the currency is going to increase. So they buy, buy, buy Bitcoin. Its value then soars to a record um, value. And they're like, wow, this is actually a lot. Let's sell out. Then everybody starts selling and the price comes down again. And this continues in a cycle. Hence, it's so volatile. And you don't want a currency to be volatile. You don't want to go and say, okay, I need to save five Bitcoin to buy an ice cream. You save your five Bitcoin, you come to the shop and they're like, oh no, now it's seven Bitcoin. Or let's say you're selling something and then, you know, the price keeps changing. Volatility is not a desirable feature in a currency. Also with Bitcoin, this is considered a pro of it, is that it cannot be minted, which means no one can just go up and say, hey guys, we're going to print um, you know, 500 Bitcoin every single day. You know, Bitcoin is not controlled by a government. So it cannot be abused, as in the case of Zimbabwe, but it cannot be used as an economic tool to stimulate um, the country's, you know, financial activity. And this is because it's decentralized. I don't want to get in too much into the technicalities of it, but the whole idea, and one of this is probably the biggest plus of Bitcoin, is that no one has complete power over it. It's only the people who collectively as a group can determine which way the currency is going to go. But then the big problem with Bitcoin is that it's not considered legal tender. And this is what a lot of governments are fighting against. They don't want it to become legal tender because that means as a government, they're going to lose a lot of their power. So we've seen in some countries such as Russia and other, quite a lot of other countries have had a negative view on Bitcoin and they don't want it in their territories. But let's go back to this whole mining. Bitcoin can be mined. And what this is, you're rewarding the guys who validate the transactions. But like I said, we don't want to get into a technical video. This is more of an economical video. But this whole mining concept, this suggests that we're getting so many Bitcoins are getting released into the ecosystem every 10 minutes. Currently, it's 25 Bitcoin. It's soon going to be halving to 12 and a half. But this whole mining analogy makes one think maybe Bitcoin is like gold. You know, you know we, all, we all know what gold is. It's that really shiny metal stuff that is considered a commodity. But gold is a special commodity because not only is it, does it fill, tick all the boxes of a normal commodity, but people have also used it as a system of money. You know, people used to have gold coins and they used to trade it and stuff like that which means gold is considered something known as commodity money. So it's a token that has actual value. So if you look at your $1 note, that, that can't be used for anything. But a one gold coin, well, that can be used. It can be melted using some computer um, hardware or, or various other things. And a very common uh, commodity money are cigarettes. Because these are things that people, it's easy and light for them to, to carry around. It facilitates in trade. But someone can always say, hey, I've got 100 cigarettes. Let me light them up and have a good time. You know, there is an alternative use for the token. And that's what we refer to as commodity money. But for something to be considered as a commodity, it needs to be involved in some sort of production chain. And Bitcoin does not fulfill this criteria. So if we look at Bitcoin, okay, it's not a raw material and it's not part of any production process. I mean, the closest you can try to say to it, it as being a, co a commodity is that it's consumed electricity, but it has no utility after that. Um, I mean, 
you might say, what about these virtual applications? Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't really fall into that category. There is something else completely different called Ethereum, which is also based on a blockchain, also is a bit of a cryptocurrency, but Ethereum is more like a commodity in the sense that it even refers to itself as being the gas to decentralized applications. So Ethereum might be more of a commodity than Bitcoin. Another thing which gets me worried about Bitcoin is, you know, what's going to happen when all the Bitcoins have been mined? And the one fear is that the entire Bitcoin system will be wiped out after this happens. It will become worthless. Let me explain the, the fear. The fear is that once all the Bitcoins have been mined, the miners will have to be compensated by taking in a transaction fee. And you need the miners to validate the system, to keep it secure, to avoid double spending and all that type of stuff. So the miners are going to be able to determine how much to charge each transaction. So if that little guy wants to send money to his girlfriend and he sends, say, 100 Bitcoin, the miners might take one Bitcoin for themselves as a transaction fee, which is problematic. Because if we look at currencies and this whole system of money, one way to think of them is, is it's a highway. It's a highway of transporting value across the, the economic system or the city type of thing like that. As soon as you start adding transaction costs or other uh, friction costs, in effect, you're adding on a toll. And like I said, currencies are tokens. And one way to think of a token is to think of a mule. So the idea is that you place a whole bunch of value onto the mule, it then walks around to its other desired location, and you offload. So let's say I want to send money to England, I buy Bitcoin, I send the money, uh, the Bitcoin to, to the address in England, who then converts it into pounds or something like that, or, or buys a house or does whatever with it. The Bitcoin in that sense is acting like a mule. Now, if there's a transaction cost and there's a fee to do that, well, then I'm going to just take a sit step back and say, well, why not just use another cryptocurrency that doesn't have such a high transaction cost? And this is where it gets very interesting, is Bitcoin has a lot of competitors. I mean, there are over now 600 different cryptocurrencies. And the one that I think is going to win is going to be one that has quite a low amount of volatility. One that I personally enjoy is something known as the dog coin. The dog coin, I mean, I think it releases 10,000 dog coins after each block. The blocks are sold much sooner than, than Bitcoin. So it's got that inflationary um, quality to it, but it's also quite stable. So I really like Dogcoin, and in my opinion, it's more of a currency than Bitcoin. But then that comes back to this question. So what is Bitcoin? Is it a currency? Is it a commodity? Or is it something completely different? Truth be told, I don't know. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. And let's have a discussion around what is this new technology and how is it going to be regulated? Should it be regulated? What should governments do? Should we be excited about it? Should we be scared? I mean, there's a lot of discussion to be had around this stuff. But as always, thanks for watching and subscribe for more videos like these. Cheers, everyone.